my first question, uh, doing, doing a little research. So your whole career with music started, I heard two sides of this, or two uh, different stories on this. Because one, you said that you played, you, both were you played with your dad's cover band. And one, it was Hotel California, and the other one was Walk This Way. So which one was it? Yeah, so the first performance was Walk This Way. And okay. I think I was like 11 or 12 years old, something like that, when I did that one. Uh, and then, like, when I was 13, I performed Hotel California with them. And I identify that performance as really, like, the spark that propelled me to pursue music for the rest of my life. Oh, uh, okay. So the other yeah, one was first, but then that, that was the big one that really was like, I want to do this for my a living. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the first time was definitely, like, magical and, like, amazing, but... Uh, that second performance, it was like this Cinco de Mayo party and there were tons of people and it was just like, you know, for a 13 year old, you really felt like a rock star up there, like shredding this solo all by yourself. And, you know, uh, just the environment was was so surreal. And it was like, oh, my gosh, like, this is what I have to do. There is nothing like this. That's so. cool. So it's yeah. all just, and it's all just, you're mostly self-taught with guitar, I know, and with singing as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. I never really took any professional uh, lessons, but obviously my dad's a guitar player. So um, I would pretty much, you know, just learn things as far as I could on my own and then go to him whenever I needed help. Uh, so yeah, there, there was never really like a, you know, every week at Wednesday at six o'clock <laughs> kind That's of not, So obviously thing. you, you guys are both super talented. It's just like a lot of it's just, it comes easy for you, right? Well, I definitely grew up in a musical family, so I've been around it my whole life. Uh, my whole mom's side of the family are all singers. Um, my maternal grandmother was in a, uh, like in a gospel quartet singing group that like toured and traveled around which i just found out about this like a couple of years ago i had no idea but um yeah so i've always been around music always been around singing harmonies um it's been a very normal part of my life i guess that i felt like everybody else probably would have had the same experience but definitely did not <laughs> yeah well and so for the singing part you you had a little bit of training because you, you were in high school choir or whatever but did you ever just like, like, did you practice singing in the mirror or the shower? Or did you like watch YouTube videos on how to, or is it more just kind of winging it? It's a lot of winging it. And then once I like, you know, started singing for Paralandra and took over like, you know, front man duties, then, you know, we were playing a lot of shows and I really had to learn like how to control my voice. Um, Cause I was blown out my voice. A lot of the time we're playing these, you know, four hour cover shows at first and night after night, that's a lot of singing. And we're covering a lot of like hard rock stuff. So um, after that, yeah, I definitely started like just looking up YouTube videos, like how to sing properly. I mean, I had a couple years of high school choir experience behind me, but never anything like what I was doing. So that's yeah, a lot of it is YouTube. Okay. Do you have any tips? Like, cause I had uh, the singer Buck Cherry on and he was saying how he doesn't drink water when he performs. And I thought that was really interesting. He said, yeah, if you drink water, like you have a craving to drink it, but it actually makes you, uh, it's harder to sing for a long time. So he doesn't drink until after the show. Wow. Well, I could not disagree more, <laughs> but I will say, uh, I do drink tea during my shows and before my shows a lot, you know, the hot tea, I put like ginger, lemon juice, cayenne pepper, apple cider vinegar, uh, local honey. You know, it's like this magical concoction <laughs> that I'm drinking like all day. But I'm also drinking tons of water, like because you got to stay hydrated. So I've got like a tons of a ton of like vocal regimen things that I do all throughout the day leading up to my performances. And you don't smoke or vape or anything like that, do you? Nah, not really. Okay. <laughs> And you're not much of a drinker, like with booze, like you do whiskey and uh, fireball sometimes, but not like, do you do that before shows or after? Or? Wow. You really been doing your research. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they tell me. But uh, yeah, I'll drink whiskey every once in a while, you know, Morley, Morley. I'm a lyricist. How about that? Uh, <laughs> more so as a social thing. Uh, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever had the whiskey. screwball? 
whiskey, the peanut yes. butter? Yes. I love it, actually. Like, peanut really butter. Good. Love peanut butter. So, yeah, that's my jam. Yeah, I remember the first time somebody told me about that. I was like, that sounds so disgusting. And then I tried it, and I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And there's also, like, this hot pickle vodka that I tried what? recently. It was insane and so good. I love pickles and pickle juice anyways. But, like, the Pickle juice is supposed to be really good for you, right? Because of the uh, sodium or something? I, I don't know. I have no clue. Drink. I mean, probably not. Like pickles. Well, maybe aren't not even the pickle real. juice vodka, but pickle juice in general is kind of like a, a natural sports drink. I've I've heard. Wow. Well, I do know that it helps with cramps. So. Oh. Yeah, you're right. You Something to it. Yeah. I'm no scientist. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we can talk science. You know. <laughs> talk all sorts of things. So wait, now you guys are based in Missouri, right? Yeah, Springfield, Missouri. Okay, so is that how you know? Because I'm in Arizona. And we have a band down here called the Black Moods, and Josh Kennedy is from Missouri. Is that how you know them? Yes, actually. Um, yeah, we have mutual friends uh, that used to own a bar in Monette, and I think that Josh is from that area. But yeah, we've played with them in Springfield a few times, and like every once in a while, we'll cross paths on the road. And yeah, I've been following those guys for years now. That's awesome. So. Yeah, what other bands are you like friends with? Because I just saw that on your Instagram. I was like, we both follow the Black Moods. I was like, oh, that's cool. She knows them. But I'm trying to think of what else. Like, I know Tantric because you guys, uh, there's a connection yep. there, obviously. Yes, yes. Good friends with the Tantric boys. Uh, that all started back in 2018. And we just couldn't be separated ever since. But uh, <laughs> that mainly had to do with me and Jaren, of course. <laughs> yeah, you toured with them too, right? or yeah yeah, yeah. we've and toured then, all over uh with the tantric guys um also like the i guess the musicians from ingve momstein's band like emilio and brian uh wilson well he doesn't play with them anymore but like uh yeah anyways nick marino they're awesome guys play with ingve super cool we keep in touch with them did you ever um, have any interaction with ingve yeah, yeah, I've had a few. And honestly, they've been pleasant. Like, really? okay. uh, there were definitely a lot of, uh, you know, rules and stipulations as far as being an opener, you know, for the tour. So we weren't allowed to be in the building during certain times. There was definitely like some rough load in situations that we ran into pretty frequently. But on a personal level, face to face, he's always been very kind to us, very complimentary. So does he still have the child? I haven't seen him. I've never seen him live. Does he still, is he still pretty amazing? Cause I know he had like a hand injury or something like that. Yeah. Honestly, when we have toured with him, he kills it every night. It's crazy. Like mind blowing. Did, did you guys also, uh, I saw something in the, in the email that uh, your publicist sent. It was, you either played a show with Dawkin or you toured with them or what was their connection there? Yeah, we played with Dawkin here in Springfield, actually. Um, it was Dakota, our drummer, Dakota Watson. It was his first show with us ever. So that was kind of a great way to dip his feet in. But yeah, here in Springfield, it was it was sick. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, because like he, my audience loves him. Like I, I, I had him on the show and it was so fascinating. Like he's just an open book. I don't know if you ever talked to him, but. He just, he just tells exactly like it is. He does not care. He does not hold back at all. It's kind of funny. That is absolutely true. I've had a few chances to hang out with him because um, my boyfriend, Jaron, plays for Lynch Mob now, plays bass. For right. Him. So, yeah. uh, boyfriend's you know, in like five bands or something, isn't he? Yeah, dude. He's the busiest guy in the industry. I mean, ridiculous, but he's a great player and is really good at his job. So I can't hold him back. <laughs> yeah. And you're in too. You're in uh, Paralandra, but also the Life Project with the Stone Sour guitarist, Josh Rand, right? Yes, correct. And actually, this year, I have another project coming out with George Lynch. We've got uh, our own album that will be what? coming out. Yeah. Is that on I literally just finished recording it last week. <laughs> is it a Frontiers thing? Yeah. Oh, okay. I was going to say, they always put these things together. And yeah, that's cool. Well, that would be interesting. I haven't even heard about that one. I know George has mentioned it in a few interviews, so I'm not trying to be too shy talking about it, but you know, yeah, it, it will be coming out. I'm super excited. So got a did lot you of write the play. songs or did he write it or you guys write it together? 
he wrote all the music and then I came in and wrote all the lyrics and the vocal melodies and stuff to go on top of it. Okay, cool. So yeah, yeah um, but the, the, ba the band with your dad, it's so interesting that uh, when you guys, so I love hearing these stories of like meeting with the industry people and they were like, they, they told you to like, uh, not ch change your name or change your dad's name. And, and you guys not to act like you weren't father and daughter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were like, you need to change his name to Paul Daniels. I'm like, why? Who cares? He's my dad. Get over it. <laughs> yeah. Cause the, 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 your reaction to, or the fans reaction has, has been mostly positive about that. Right. People are like, Oh, that's oh. so cool. You get to play with your dad. Yeah, literally, it's been 100% positive from everyone else's perspective, except for like a few management record label, you know, companies. And it's like, well, who cares? You're not coming to my shows. So right. have that opinion. <laughs> who, is your, who is your management now? So uh, that's hard to say. We don't really have management. We are self-managed, but okay. we have arm uh, entertainment that books for us. And we also do a bit of self booking and then we're releasing our album through legend recordings, which uh, is based out of Ohio. We've worked with them for years and years since our first release, actually all fall down back in whatever 2016, I think. So yeah, but they're, they don't really manage us. So yeah, we're, we're self-managed, I guess you could say. But were you with red light management for a little while? They're a very short jaunt. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, then we just, honestly, if I have to be 100% transparent, we cannot find a management group that can outwork us. So oh. I just, I don't see the point in relinquishing, you know, my voice to someone who's not going to work as hard as me. Wow. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Because I've noticed that too. I feel like, uh, I mean, even with the publicists, I feel like sometimes there's they, they're they're managing so many different bands that they don't they can't give their attention to every it's impossible, you know. Right. So, yeah. Right. That is absolutely true because you know my full time job, like pretty much, is Paralandra. So like I'm every single day working on booking, working on you know merch or whatever it may be that day. And I get that if you're a management group, you're doing that for multiple bands every mm -hmm. single day. So it's really hard to just like, you know, devote an right. hour or devote two hours just to this one band. And how many bands do you have? So like, I get it. It's a crazy workload. But I mean, up until now, it's been great just doing it ourselves. So and we get a lot done and we do it the way we want to. And you know, so it's it's kind of like most of your job is like basically like business and like band manager. And then you have some time to obviously work on music, play your guitar, sing, write songs and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's 95 percent business and five percent of the time I'm on stage. <laughs> oh, shit. But then once you book a tour, then I'm assuming it would be a lot more. I mean, well, at least you get to do a show every night or not. Maybe not every night, but like if you I mean, is that what you're going to do is actual like a tour? Oh, yeah. So I yeah. pretty much am tour routing like all the time, 24 seven booking shows, looking at routes like, you know, one day it will pop up four weeks after another date. So now I'm like, OK, now we got to figure out how to get to and from. So you start filling in the in the spots. And uh, anyway, yeah, so it's always, always ever changing. Yeah. I'm always so fascinated by that because it, is it kind of like a math? I feel like it's like those SAT questions like this. Two trains are traveling at 50 miles an hour. And this train left at the, like, right? I mean, is that kind of what you're trying to do? It's like a math problem or something. Literally, yes. I'm on Google Maps, like, all day, like, looking at how many miles is it from point A to point B and, like, you know, measuring it out in distances and, well, what city could we go to next? Like, what's a good market on the way to this place? And, and then you've yeah. got to calculate in, like, how much gas costs and how much hotel costs and how much you're going to get paid and, and all that stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow what a nightmare like i guess it could be kind of fun in a way but like it's fun but it is a nightmare for sure <laughs> yeah because sometimes like you can't you can't find something right like to, to match it up like if you want it like i'm in arizona so like if let's say you wanted to go like do vegas phoenix and then la like maybe like that you couldn't get a phoenix one so then you what do you just have to take a night off or something right 
Exactly. Yeah. Or a show gets canceled last second. Mm -hmm. That happened to us on the winter heat tour, like literally a few days before. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not gonna be able to do it. It's like, oh, okay. Well, I'll just go screw myself for a night. Cool. You know? Yeah. Like, I mean, what well, can like you, you saw, do? Yeah. Did you see that thing? Like it was a few, uh, maybe it was a few weeks or months ago, but Anthrax, uh, I mean, they're one of the top four biggest thrash metal bands of all time. And they had to cancel their European tour tour because it just didn't make sense financially for them to even do it. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. Like, it is definitely, um, it costs a lot of money to go on tour, to pay for the gas, to pay for the hotels, the food, you know, all of the stuff. And then, of course, you got, like, transmission problems. Literally, like, our last show on Saturday, our transmission went out, and we, like, just barely rolled into the parking lot. Had to get it towed, you know, however many, two hours back to Springfield. So it's just like some it's things that you have to account for, but you never know when it's going to happen. So, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's rough. Yeah. Now, do you guys typically get like a flat rate for a show or is it like you get a percentage of the door or something? Because like I remember there was this band. I don't know if you've heard of the band uh, Vigil of War, but they came and like and uh, I it's weird. Like the, the people never took my money at this at the door for the ticket. And so I I felt bad. So I went to the bass player and i was like hey like they never took my money she goes oh it's okay we got a flat rate so we don't care i was like all right well let me buy a t-shirt nice well it honestly changes venue to venue like mm. there's really no rhyme or reason it's just what is the deal with this particular venue you know okay uh so what yeah. about getting on with other bands like on a package because isn't that ideal because then like you wouldn't even have to to book you do any of that stuff right like if they like if you got on with opening spot with docking or something like and you're on the tour and they've already booked it and you're just opening wouldn't that be the best scenario yeah that would be great <laughs> that would be awesome that was like uh how it was when we went on tour with Ingve, uh both in 2019 and 2021 like the whole thing was already mapped out and we just jumped on it was a dream like didn't have to do really any of the back end work except just show up so um, that's definitely the preference. Plus, you've got the built in crowd. You're the underdogs, which I love, you know, just like blowing people's minds that have never heard of you. And uh, it's so much fun. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah, or, that, so, that would definitely be my preference. Or what about like packaging yourselves with other bands of similar styles and similar size uh, fan, uh, fan bases and audiences? I mean, because there's so many bands that, you know, have a similar amount of followers and, and listens or whatever on spot. You guys could package together like three or four or five of you guys and go out and make it a package thing. And, and then, you know, their fans come out and see you and then, you know, you make new fans of each other's. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, we just did a little something like that. Um, earlier this month, it was called the Midwest monsters tour. Oh. And pretty much I just invited, uh, Troy or the reality of yourself. They're also Springfield, Missouri based. And then the Many Colored Death, which they're Columbia, Missouri based, and both just like insane powerhouse bands. Um, so we packaged up for a few shows and then we played in Springfield, Kansas City, St. Louis, uh, Rolla, just, you know, some surrounding area shows and had a great time. So, you know, we oh. we try to do that kind of stuff as often as we can because they're truly perfect. like great bands that deserve to be heard yeah um and we really believe in them so yeah we do that all the time we're just like that's you guys awesome. are awesome you need yeah. more people to hear you come play some shows with us you know yeah because there's some cool i'm trying to think i always like space out like but like i had the guys i don't know if you heard of the band of limbo those guys are hilarious and they're really good live they opened up for faster pussycat um classless act which you know they just opened on that stadium tour like there's a lot of fun younger up and coming bands that I think would be cool. I would love to see, so, see somebody put a package of like five of these guys together. You guys could jump on add the black moods or something. I think that'd be an a, a amazing show. Seriously. We've been talking with the black moods like Ooh. for years about that. We're like we got to do something. Yes. So <laughs> I will, You're I right. would promote that. I would come to the show. I bring all two of my friends and, uh, Oh, I, think I appreciate it, man. Yeah, that's all it takes. Everybody bring two friends. Yeah, there you go. So you guys, uh, is this, I know you have a couple new songs right now. Is there a full album coming? Because I was trying to look and maybe the publicist just didn't send it to me. Or do you have re re other music recorded that you're going to release? 
Yeah. So oh. we've got a new album called The Body Electric that is dropping on April 4th. Okay. Uh, we've already released two singles. So we released Dirty Love in January. And then we did Love of My Life um, beginning of February. It was a, a ballad. It's very different than anything we've ever done before. Yeah, the uh, piano we've got a, is cool. Yeah. And it's funny because nobody in our band plays piano. So oh. like <laughs> well, playing did- it live, we just have to come up with another version. But uh oh really you would, so you wouldn't play it with a track are you like against that We don't play with tracks we just prefer to you know do it old school see what four people can do with their hands and mouths you know <laughs> Yeah you could use an acoustic or something or yeah you could it'd be interesting to hear that song live without the piano Yeah exactly so that's what we've been doing um my dad has been doing kind of a version of the piano on his guitar and Kind of has oh, you like, know what you should get is one of those uh keytars. Right? Have you I ever seen that? Get, like, um, I think it's called the B9 by Electro Harmonics. It's a pedal yeah. that is like all organ sounds, keyboard sounds. Um, anyway, I'm like, just get that. It'll literally sound like a piano. It's yeah. gonna blow people's minds. Yeah, so. that would be cool. So who did and the on the record who played it then? You got somebody else? Yeah, it's my good friend Peyton Palin. He lives here in Springfield. We've grown up together and he's just an incredible pianist. So I could think of no one more perfect when it came down to it. So, okay. He recorded it at home, sent off the track while we were in the studio and we just threw it into the session and played along to it. Is it the same producer on this album than the last one? It's a a Michael Elvis Basquette who's produced like Mammoth and Alter Bridge and Slash and Seven Dust. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. He's amazing to work with. Seriously, just an incredible human being, aside from being great at what he does. Really? I should try to get him on the podcast. I bet he's got some stories. Did he tell you some good stories about the people he's worked with? Oh, yeah. But good luck getting him to talk about it. Oh, really? Is, <laughs> is it one of those? Yeah, because they don't want to, like, burn the bridge or whatever. And so, yeah, I get that. Unless yeah, it's a but positive he's story. He's told us some funny stories. Um I will say there was one like uh, where I guess Slash was like walking around on the street outside of the studio and uh, there's like a police, a policeman that lives a couple doors down that saw him walking around. He's just on the phone. And so the guy comes over like a day later and he's like, hey, is uh, that Slash in your driveway? And he's like, yep, see you later. And just like goes right back inside, like very private. But, you know, every once in a while, Slash will be walking around and you'll just wonder what the heck. Wow. What, what city is that in? <laughs> Where would that be? California, L.A. or something? Uh, he's actually in Florida, Orlando. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Does Slash walk or you think he just walks around with a top hat like all the time? I think he probably does a mixture of the top hat. And I think I've seen him in the baseball hats. Yeah. But I think it's always got to be a hat. Yeah. A lot of times. Yeah, it's true. Oh, that'd be so and weird. always with the sunglasses, inside, what? outside, nighttime, daytime. Yeah, I remember when I was 15, no, like 16 maybe, uh, Gilby Clark, I used to live in Seattle, and Gilby Clark from Guns N' Roses, well, ex-Guns N' Roses, played with his solo band, and or no, sorry, it was Slash's Snake Pit, but Gilby Clark was playing in it, but um, they, we waited backstage, and Slash walked, he walked out from backstage. He walked right by me. And I, I was like, I was just like, I froze. And then everyone went around and asked for autographs. So I got an autograph, but it's surreal to see that guy in in real life. It is so weird. I actually kind of had one of those experiences on the kiss cruise a few years ago. Oh, right. I, I heard like, about this. Oh yeah. I was just like down watching the darkness. And then I turn around and literally simultaneously Paul Stanley and I lock eyes side to side. And I'm like, and just run away. <laughs> like said nothing. Just got it, out of there. He wasn't getting mobbed by everyone else, or was he already signed all the autographs and everything? No, I mean he was just hanging out. He would hang out every night, and people would just kind of like let him be. And he oh. loves watching all the bands. So yeah, you kind of always see him around. But I just was not expecting to see him standing shoulder to shoulder with me, and for us to just have a moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. Did you ever get to? Talk to him later, or get a picture or anything? Or no. <laughs> no. I love the mystique of rock stardom. So I prefer not to talk to people. 
Hmm. Yeah, there is definitely like, see, when I was a kid, before the internet really took off, it's like, it was just like, you'd read about them in like a, a like Metal Edge magazine or all these magazines and stuff. And it was like, they just seem like these untouchable people. And then now yeah. I start doing them all. And I'm like, this is so weird. Like, these are people that I had posters of on my walls when I was a kid. And now we're just having this conversation. It's really bizarre. It's super weird. It's like superheroes or something. Yes. Like, they seem invincible or something. I don't know. Like, just a character. But... Yeah, yeah, obviously, it's really cool to, like, have a great conversation with your hero, like, but uh, I don't yeah. know. I just, I like the mystique. I, I would rather, like, see them from afar and be like, oh, and, like, feel the butterflies, you know? <laughs> yeah, but you gotta, you gotta push past that and then, and then have that conversation and meet them, like, I think, I think, because people say, don't meet your heroes. I'm like, I disagree. I, I love to meet my heroes. I think it, it's fascinating. And a lot of times they live up to the hype and they're That's like, true. Like, like John Karabi, I don't know if you remember him. He was the singer of Motley Crue for like five years. But like that yeah. was when I got into the band. And so I remember like I had his poster up and stuff. And I reached out to him, tried to get him on my show. I'm thinking, oh, he'll never reach out. He, my phone rings. It says Beverly Hills number. I'm like, what is, I was, what is, I answer the phone. It's him. It's not his publicist. Like he called me. It was the weirdest thing. Uh, I'll still, I'll never forget that. That was a weird moment. That is so cool. Actually, like, I have run into to John Karabi as well because his son Ian played for Tantric for a while. That's right. Yeah. So that ended up being just like a crazy coincidence. And same thing, like uh, Sebastian, who played guitar for Tantric, his dad uh, was Jeff Labar from Cinderella. So right. yeah. I got to meet him and it was just very surreal. Like, these are regular guys. Jeff Labar is making me fried chicken in his kitchen right now. What the heck? Like... I pulling yeah, out he, the bones for me because he knows that I don't like him. Like what? <laughs> yeah, I heard he's like really was a was a really cool guy. Like I, I had this uh, po other podcast from my show when I first started, and I said, "Who's like the best guest you ever had?" And he said, "Jeff Labar. He's hilarious." Yes, Jeff was an incredible person. Hilarious, like so hospitable. I don't know. I only got to hang out with him a few times, uh, like with Sebastian. You know, when we were in Nashville. But uh, yeah, just like the nicest, most just regular guy. <laughs> That's cool. I, I love those those kind of I love hearing those kinds of stories. Like and I love the people that are just like like the Don Dawkins that are like almost like some people might even say they're a little crazy, but I like it because it's just like they don't hold back. Like, you know, he's you can tell Don Dawkins like he doesn't give a fuck because he's like, I'm old. I don't care anymore. And he even said about like his thing with George Lynch, he's like. He's like, look, you got gray hair. I got gray hair. Let's just let it go. I don't care about the past. And that's great. I love it. It's so funny because like those guys really don't care. Like every day on Blabbermouth, it's like another quote. <laughs> like yeah. kissing the other guy going back and forth. I'm like, oh man, these guys are just letting it all hang out. Do you follow, right. the, do you follow all the Blabbermouth drama and stuff? I really don't follow it closely, but when it pops in my feed, like I enjoy, you know, scrolling past a little bit of drama every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it is kind of like fast. And then people say like, well, this is terrible. We shouldn't be doing this. But then like everybody only likes those kinds of like stories. Like those are the most popular stories. Like it, if Blabbermouth did a story about your new album right now, it's like, that would not get as many hits as if like Don Dawkins calls Vince Neil fat or something like it's, and that's right. like, it's kind of sad, but it also is like a little bit of a reality too. Seriously. I mean, you can't look away from a trash fire. Like <laughs> that is so weird. So yeah, I wanted to talk, ask you about that because like the whole like fat shaming thing, weren't you told by the record label that you should drop 20 pounds or something like that? Oh like, yeah. I was, I was told that multiple times. That oh, I needed to lose by weight. different people or the same person? Different people. Yeah. Like, especially when we were first starting, um, which, you know, I look back at pictures of myself and I wasn't fat and I definitely had more of a baby face than I do now. I was in my early 20s. Um, but anyway, it's just crazy to me that the industry is so superficial and I, I guess you kind of know that it is going into it, but like then being on the receiving end of it and being like, well, what is wrong with me? Like, I, I feel like I go to the gym. I'm active. Kind of watch what I eat, <laughs> you know? 
Well, do you think it's worse for women though? Cause like, I mean, we're talking about like Vince Neal and Axl Rose, like they gained some weight and they got so many trolls and comments, but like Amy Schumer, I don't know if you're following that story at all, but she did a talk show and her face was a little puffy and she just got lamb blasted. What's wrong with her? Well, it turns out she has some, uh, Cushing syndrome, I think that, uh, causes an increase in cortisol. And so her face looks a little right. puffy. And she said that uh, women are judged more harsh than men. Do you agree a with that? A million times. Really? Uh, yeah. I mean, for example, like just there's like the dad bod trend, but like, <laughs> that is I'm really like, okay, weird. why isn't, why isn't mom bod a thing then? <laughs> like, hey, that's a really real. good point. You're right. So mom bod be a thing. We need to make that trend. What the hell? Yeah. So anyways, that's my opinion. <laughs> that and is hilarious. You're right. Why did no one come up with that mom bod? I've never heard that before. That is a great counter. Thank I you. I so love it. anyway, I think it's a little lopsided, but hey, we'll get there. <laughs> well, and I feel like it's not accurate. I remember in the, like, you're too young, but I remember in the 90s, there was this model, Kate Moss, and she just, I just did not find her attractive. She was so skinny. It was, it's just gross to me. And I'm like, I feel like most guys do not want that. Do they do not want a stick figure girl. So it's kind of like weird to me when, I mean, obviously there's, you know, there's differences when people are like morbidly obese, but that's, that's right. very different than uh, just being a few pounds, like overweight or whatever, having a little meat on your bones. I feel like most guys like that, prefer that. I would agree. I mean, I definitely have those moments. I mean, you know, being around Jaren where we're just like pigging out and we love to eat. We love to try new restaurants. Um, that's just something that we do a lot. And so, you know, I'll be like, oh my gosh, I am so fat. Like I need to take it easy. <laughs> and he's like, no, you're, you look amazing. I love it Aww. whenever you're a little bit like, you know, on the heavier side. So that's a good boyfriend. You need to keep yeah. her. He's a keeper. So yeah, I've got a little bit of that balance. You know, I've got to keep myself in check. I do want to be healthy, you know, and yes. be mindful of what I'm putting into my body. But at the same time, like, don't feel bad about it if you need to let loose every once in a while and just pig out for a month straight. <laughs> <laughs> for a but few yeah. months in my in my case. I, I just yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to cut down, but I try to still do at least um, I mean, even my trainers will say like, you should have, you should have like a cheat meal a week because it'll, because otherwise, if you try to restrict yourself for, for so long, like you'll just, you won't be, you won't be able to hang on. Cause there's just so much good food in the world. Like you gotta eat it sometimes. I know. And there's like so much guilt and shame when you've been on a roll for so long. And then it's like the end of the world. If you've gone like three months with no sugar and all of a sudden you eat some sugar and you're like, ah, oh, what have I done? And you know, like maybe just like moderation, have a little bit here and there. That way you don't feel so guilty about it and you're still doing a great job. So yeah, I mean, enjoy, enjoy like, life. Some of it's like crack though. Like what is your like weakness? Cause for me, it's like, I, I feel cheesecake is so good. And I try to don't, I obviously don't like keep it in the house or anything, but that is like amazing. Is there something for you that's you're like, you have to have this. Well, I love Dr. Pepper. I like so much. I could easily drink a 12 pack in a day. Like it's that addictive for me. So good. So I try and limit my Dr. Pepper intake to like maybe once a week, I'll have it on a day and like allow myself to indulge. But uh, I don't know if wow. you've seen like Post Malone lost like 60 pounds from just removing soda from his diet. Like, wow, so no, I didn't see it. Now, does it matter? See, I've always heard conflicting things too about the, 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 what do you like the zero sugar, the diet? Dr. Pepper, like, because people say like, well, you can lose weight by switching to that, but then also the chemicals and it will give you cancer. So right. The aspartame. So like what Jaren has told me, I obviously, I love my boyfriend so much. We're talking about him a lot, but he's is like, that the if song, you're gonna... by the way, is that love of my life? I'm assuming that's about him, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was an anniversary present for him back in 2020. I never ended up like, I never wanted to release it, but Everybody told me we had to, so we ended up doing it. <laughs> but wow. yeah, cool. but anyway, anyways, sorry. what he has told me is like, if you're gonna have a soda, have a soda, like enjoy it. And then like, don't drink something that tastes worse and is worse for you. Like, why would you do that? 
So anyways, that's what I always think. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to have a soda. Yeah. I'm going to have a soda. But now you mostly drink water and celery juice. Yeah. It's like sounds Jeez, really good. Really I've been doing your research, man. Yeah. I love it. I love learning about people. I think you're interested. I think everyone's interesting really, but yeah, I thought that was interesting. Like celery juice. Like do you make it fresh or you, you can't like buy that prepackaged. Can you? No, nah, I make it fresh at home. It's way better fresh anyways. Like even if you go like, I don't know, to a buffet or something. And they're like, we'll make some celery juice for you. It's always disgusting. Like I get like this organic brand uh, from here in Springfield and it's like super sweet. And uh, yeah, I'll make like a full glass of it and drink that every day. And it's really good for you. And you notice any like really health benefits from like, the, if you drink a bunch of celery juice, does it clear up your skin or something? Or does it have some sort of benefit like that? Yeah, it's like, honestly, it's just kind of a really good thing for your body in general. Like if you have any dead or sickly white blood cells or some type of cells, again, I'm not a scientist, <laughs> but it it heals you from within. Uh, you know, if you're sick or whatever, knocks out whatever is attacking your body. Um, it's really great for digestion, um, great for your gut. So, yeah. I heard I heard a rumor. Well, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard that Peter North drank celery juice. If you don't know who that is, do not Google it. But I thought that was the weirdest thing. So that's why I asked that. I'm like, that's really interesting. I, for, for if a female takes it, what is what is the benefit to it? But I'm sure it has all sorts of health benefits. Yeah, honestly, I don't know. I just feel like a better person when I drink it. <laughs> yeah, I need to try. Like, I think I tried it one time and I was like, oh, this is really hard to do. You put like a cayenne pepper in or something to make it go down better? Or? Well, I do that in my tea, but the celery juice I do straight. Okay. Wow. Yeah. See, that's good though. Yeah. It's like you're getting on some of the, the health kick too, but yeah, I mean, the occasional Dr. Pepper isn't going to kill you. That's for sure. Right. I got to have it. It makes me so happy. Yeah. Like why deny myself? Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah. So talk about like your, I, I thought this was really cool. Cause I think I heard you talking about like why you want to be in a band and like, what, what is the point? Cause I, when you get older, you get in your forties and stuff, you start thinking about those kinds of things. Like, what is the point of all this? What is the purpose? But like for you, you said you kind of, you really do want to like inspire people and help people and change the world with your band. Yeah. I mean, the whole like message behind Paralandra and our songs, it's all like very uplifting, you know, positive energy, very much, uh, you are loved, you are accepted in this place, you know, Whoever you are, however you present yourself, we're gonna love you no matter what. So we like to really send no matter out that what. Message. That's kind of a that's a bold statement. No matter what, murderers, we're gonna love you. No, nah, but, like, but I feel like that is saying? like the, I agree though. That is the reason to me for music is that it brings people together from and and sports, I guess in some ways too. But like you know, you go to a concert. And it should be people from all different backgrounds and ages. And like the one thing we have in common, I mean, yeah, we have a lot of things that are not in common. We could talk about that for years, but when you go to the concert, you, everyone puts that stuff aside and everyone is singing along to the same songs and rocking out together. And I think that's amazing. Yeah. That's the cool thing about music is um, it's all like so subjective, like as far as how you're going to interpret it. Like a song can mean so many different things to different people. And it's so personal like that. Like uh, the song Love of My Life, a lot of people have been like, oh my gosh, I feel like you're saying what I would say, like, you know, to somebody. And it feels very much like uh, they're just connected with it. Um, so I don't know, just like, and there's so much division in the world, like, especially politically, I feel like we're very much divided um in a lot of areas and so we just kind of want to you know offer that middle ground that like safe place where we don't have to worry about you know what everybody believes about this or that like let's just enjoy some music and just like have a good time and not be divided by stupid little things <laughs> but how do we how do we work past those things like how, how do we how do we, I mean, is it just through the music and we just try to forget about it for a little while? Cause I feel like these, <laughs> some of these issues are just never, they just don't go away. And it's so frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I will never claim to have all the answers, but 
I just know that I try to tell myself every day to just love people, to love me and just look at every single person and be like, I love that person. I don't know who you are. I love you and treat them in that way. And I really don't think anything bad could ever happen from doing that in your life. I think you're only reaping what you sow. So um, I don't know. I think it starts from within. I think you got to figure out how to love yourself and then figure out how to love other people. That's great advice. I I can, I agree 100%. I, and I've definitely heard that because a lot of people that have so much hate for someone because they're different, it's usually because they really technically hate themselves and they're, they're just projecting that hate onto this other thing or other person or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's like four agreements that I try to, you know, maintain in my daily life, which is uh, be impeccable with your word, to never make assumptions, to, uh, what is it? Sorry, I'm like, now I'm on the spot. But anyways, no, this is great. Four this is... Easy things that, you know, can just change your perspective on life. Um, now I'm, I got to look it up because I'm here and I'm talking about it. And I feel like if anybody's listening, this could definitely benefit someone. Yeah. Do you listen I, to like, uh, inspirational podcasts or read books or something, or how do you come up with some of this life philosophy? Yeah, I definitely listen to podcasts. I listen to YouTube therapy things because I can't afford therapy. Uh, <laughs> but okay, I got to pull that up. So be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions and always do your best. And if you can do those four things, you'll just be a lot happier of a person, I think. And that's worked for me. So yeah, that's great stuff. I love it. That's amazing. And um, what are the, what other any other advice you have for people or pe like uh, people that want to start a band uh, that want to make it in the music business? Because you're you're successful. You're doing it. You're living the dream. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that I mean anything is possible if you want it bad enough. So I mean, for me, like didn't grow up with a family that had a ton of money. So, you know, everything was something that I had to work for. So, you know, if you want to be a musician, go out there, find people who are like-minded and hone in on your craft, be great at what you do and don't be afraid to promote yourself and be proud of yourself. Cause ultimately you got to be your best own cheerleader too. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I I guess I would just say if there's anything you want in your life, if you don't want to be confined to the nine to five, you don't have to be. So just, I, you know, yeah. come I up agree. with a plan and execute it. Yeah. People should definitely follow their dreams, do what they love. I mean, within reason, obviously, if you've got, you know, mortgage and kids and stuff, don't quit your job and, and start a band and think it's going to pay <laughs> all those bills right away. But with time, you start a side project, a cover band on the weekends, and, you know, you work your way up to the so where you're doing it full time, I think it's possible for sure. Exactly. You just like, even if you want to daydream, just like think about where you are now, where you want to be, and then fill in hypothetically, whatever steps ha would have to happen in order for you to get there in whatever world. And then be like, oh, well, I can attain that step. Oh, well, I can attain that step. If this step, you know, like you just, I would say externalize it write it down, you know, come up That's with a plan. Great. I love it. Well, this is great. And uh, you've got a, a new album coming out in April and tour is in the works, you said, or you have some dates already set? Yeah, we have a lot of anchor dates happening this summer. I had some more come in today and uh, I think it's going to be not necessarily a tour where we're like on with another band for the entire time. But we're going to have a lot of dates in a lot of different places. And I'm going to be filling in those routes as we speak. <laughs> so, okay, cool. Um, well, let me know plan, if you come to Arizona. I'll come, uh, I'll come see if I'm in town. I actually think we might be in Winslow, Arizona on June 21st. So, oh, Winslow in June would be good. Because, yeah, that's like I like getting out of here in uh, in the summer. And Winslow's a lot cooler. I love Winslow, actually. It's really have you ever been there? It's a cool town. We've driven through it twice and we always stop for gas there so that we can say we put our feet down in Winslow, Arizona. But have you did you go stand <laughs> on the corner with the statue that's got the, the, the tribute to that song? Oh, 
oh no we haven't done that well you got to do that next time yeah it's like there's a thing it's like standing on a quarter of the winslow arizona it's like and a flatbed ford there it's 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 really cool that is awesome man yeah we've missed it but but yeah we always make sure to stop at least and get gas all right. <laughs> awesome. there. But, but yeah hopefully that'll get confirmed and you know my plan my personal goal for this band is to hit the east coast we'll already be on the west coast in oregon in august so i plan on booking more west coast shows uh in that time frame we're gonna hit as many places as we can this year okay awesome i look forward to it and uh, people can follow you on social media uh, two of the new songs are out now and your previous all your previous stuff is on spotify and then you can buy merch on your website i'm assuming too yup it's all there cool all right thanks so much for doing this i appreciate it thanks so much for having me appreciate it all right bye-bye <laughs> bye thank you for taking the time to listen to the full podcast episode please help support our guests by following them on social media and purchasing their products whether it be a book album film or other thing and if you have a few extra dollars, please consider donating it to their favorite charity. If you want to support the show, you can like, share, and comment on this episode on social media and YouTube. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can give us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. Finally, make sure you're subscribed to the show on YouTube for the video versions and other exclusive content. We appreciate your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.